Okay, not much confidence, but I think you will get this. Okay, so forecasting, really important skill that allows us to predict the future. This is like a really, really exciting skill that I'm like uh, really excited to bring. Um, I, I, like, okay, context. I'm actually testing this class for a course that I'm gonna be imparting in Cambridge University during the first week of October. So this is like a spoiler that I'm bringing uh, to all of you guys. So you can like help me improve how I'm gonna be teaching this class in Cambridge. So I will appreciate if you take any notes, if you have any feedback about how I can improve this class. Oh, please just like note it down and after the class, just uh, make sure that it reaches my way. So what's forecasting? Uh, so when I was in high school, I had a very unsophisticated world model of how things worked, right? I go like divide statements in like two groups, things that were true and things that were false. But then I had like this big realization. Actually, if I jump out of the window, it's not sure that I'm going to die or get seriously hurt. Like maybe uh, something unexpected will happen. I will get caught up in the window and not fall after all. And that led me to believe like, oh, actually the things that I can put in the buckets of like true and false are like actually quite limited. Most things fall into this intermediate bucket that's called uncertain. And uh, I became like a really pesky kid that was all the time looking smug and going like, can you actually prove that? I'm like sure people cannot actually prove most of their beliefs. They cannot actually like really justify why they believe what they believe. But do you still have like uh, lots of information about the world works? And like uh, some years later, I started studying like probability and statistics and I realized, holy shit, there's not like two buckets at all. There's actually like a full spectrum of buckets from things that I'm like pretty sure they're false to things that I'm pretty sure they're true. Well, there's like a whole uh, spectrum in between of like probabilities, of like measures of uncertainty that I could be assigning to things. And if I think I can prove, I can assign probability zero to the probability that if I jump out the window, I will splatter and die, I can still be like pretty damn sure that something like that's going to happen. And that can guide my decision making. So this is what forecasting is all about. It's about quantifying your uncertainty so you can make better decisions. Like, I think that it is quite important to develop like this sophisticated mentality of like things that are not like always false or always true, but they fall in between. Because a very common failure mode that I see in people is like they run down like low probabilities to zero and they go like, huh, it's like practically certain that if I apply to Cambridge University, I will not get in. And then they do not apply. But actually, if you have the, if you're sophisticated enough to tell, well, there's like a 10% chance probability and you apply, well, maybe nine, of ten, nine out of 10 times, like, if you're well calibrated, you will uh, get rejected. But like one in 10 times, you actually will get in. So if you try like <coughs> 10 times uh, this kind of thing with like different applications, actually you're gonna end up like getting access to some very cool opportunities. So yeah, embrace uncertainty. Uh, uh, have in your mind how you can like actually calibrate like how much, pro uh, how certain do you think uh, a certain outcome is with like how costly it is actually to try to pursue that thing? The second uh, reason why I believe that forecasting is like such an awesome skill is because it's like a very nuanced language. So, so. Uh, in my line of research, I talk a lot with people from different fields who have like vastly different opinions on my own. And, and we talk about very sophisticated, very complicated stuff that is hard to wrap your head around. And like sometimes you use like language which is vague, 
and that leads people to like disagree and have like very long conversation of, about what what do we even mean about the things we're talking about? So like, for example, I was talking with this expert at the demo and AI safety team, and we were having a disagreement about how fast uh, will we get from like human level artificial intelligence to artificial intelligence which vastly outperforms like human capabilities. And this is like a complicated, nasty topic, and she was like, you know, like people around this area actually have like a strong intuition of this time is not that short, but actually I believe that uh, we have reasons to expect that it will be a bit longer. And I was like, huh, I disagree. I think that we should expect it to be like a bit shorter than what other people believe. And then like we started like exchanging reasons for and against, and like half an hour in, I was like, wait, actually, what do you exactly mean by this time being like long? And I'm like, Oh, uh, I assign like about the ten percent probability that we will uh, that we will get from like human level artificial intelligence to superhuman artificial intelligence in less than two years. And it was like, oh, actually, you were uh, you were saying that this probability was like low, but uh, the probability that I had in mind uh, that you believed was like one percent. So like actually like we agreed from the beginning and we have just like wasted time, uh, valuable time because we actually agreed on the conclusion after all. So <coughs> it allows you to make better decisions. It is a very nuanced language. And lastly, uh, I think it can help you improve your judgment. Like, there are many people out there who win the bread by doing like vague forecasting and then like when the things happen or they happen they retreat to like their vagueness and they're like oh maybe Donald Trump will like lose in the election and then like when Donald Trump wins people go back and go like wait you said that he was going to win and they said oh no I didn't say that he was going to win I said that maybe he was going to win so like, this is actually a thing that I predicted all along. And like, I myself feel tempted to retreat to those things. Like, it, it comes to mind, like earlier this year, I signed up to a prestigious forecasting program related to development of artificial intelligence and quite into this topic. And they were like, uh, and I was like, oh, there's like, uh, 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 at, the at the beginning I was like, oh, there's absolutely no chance that I will get in. I like I made my forecast, right? And then like after they after they actually accepted me to the group, I was like, oh, actually in hindsight, like uh, the probabilities was like really high. I like I knew all along that I was going to get in, and then I was able to go back to like my original probability estimate that if I remember correctly was around ten percent. I was like, oh shit, uh, it was like very low. I was like very poorly calibrated here. I still have put it here a far higher probability. And uh, that kind of feedback loop is what actually makes you improve. Like knowing when you were wrong and how wrong you were is like uh, a key step in order to make, metaphor make, uh, make better forecasting and have a better judgment. So those are like the three reasons why I believe that this is like a very important and very useful skill uh, to have. Uh, I want to get a sense of like how pumped people are about learning how to do this. This is like very pumped. This is like, you still need to convince me more. This is like, oh God, what have I got to do? <laughs> how pumped are you guys? Pretty pumped. <laughs> Pretty pumped. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, so I'm going to explain to you how this class is going to work. Uh, it's going to be a fairly involved class, so actually I will ask you to have around like some pen and paper. Essentially what we are going to be doing over
over this class is uh, we're going to be working through exercises of how to do forecasting. Essentially, it's going to be a very long forecasting exercise where, like, actually you are going to choose what you're going to be forecasting. So that choice is up to you. Uh, in the beginning, we're going to be talking about how to make, like, precise forecasts in, like, probabilistic language, like what exactly does this mean, it's coming. And then we will, I will explain a technique that's called like reference class forecasting that uh, Ted Locke, a uh, researcher that uh, researches how to improve human judgment, is like, uh, has uh, shown in a, random, in a randomly controlled trial that uh, just by teaching people how to do this in a 50 minute session, the accuracy of the forecast improves around like 10%. So let's see if we can match that. And lastly, I'm gonna be talking about how you can actually score how well your forecasts are, uh, how accurate your forecasts are, right? So that then later, in the future, once you practice more forecasting and you have more data, you can build on that feedback loop to actually become a better forecaster. Does that make sense so far? All right, exciting. Let's go in with like operationalizing or how to make like very precise uh, forecasting statements. I think that uh, the main scene of like bad forecasting is like uh, specifying outcomes that are actually like really vague and you can like really tell if you were wrong or you were right. So like, for example, let's imagine um, uh, one example may be like, oh, I think that Europe is going to disintegrate and like it has no future and like that's bad, but I'm pretty sure that that's going to happen. Uh, if somebody comes, uh, if you try to, if you come up with that, then like it's hard to build like a clear feedback loop on that because like let's go like 10 years into the future. Like maybe Brexit has happened, or maybe it's about to happen. Uh, should you count that as your forecast was right? Should you count it that your forecast was wrong? Uh, it's hard to tell, right? But uh, but fortunately, we are like people with a mathematical background, and we are like quite keen on quantifying. And that's kind of like what I'm going to invite you to do: put actual numbers on the thing. Make sure that. The outcome that you're trying, uh, whose chance you're trying to forecast, is like very clearly defined, so that when the date of resolution of your forecast comes about, external third parties will be able to unequivocally decide whether the uh, the outcome was like true or false. So, like maybe for the Europe example, you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna be estimating chances that by January 2021, all uh, existing EU members, EU members will uh, remain in the EU. And this is closer to a forecasting statement that uh, has a cleaner resolution. Like now we know exactly by when are we going to check whether this prediction was like true or false and what's like the condition. Maybe there is like a bit of uncertainty around like what exactly does it mean that it will remain. Maybe we want to like pin it down to in the official uh, European Union webpage, uh, all existing EU members are still listed as like members. That would be a way of like operationalizing the question. And like we are still not esti uh, estimating the chances of this happening. That comes later. Like right now, what we really want to make sure is that we define like two outcomes, a uh, true outcome and a false outcome by a very complete date, so that uh, we are like uh, so that we can like uh, tell reliably whether the whether this outcome was like true or false once the resolution game comes, right? Is everybody with me? This is like, yes, this is like, I need, I need more examples. Okay, I think that some people need more examples. 
So let's go for another one. Uh, let's imagine that I go like, look, I'm a professional forecaster, and I'm going to tell you that modern cryptography is like very insecure. Well, that's like a very shitty forecast. It's insecure. That's like very bad because I haven't specified by uh, I haven't specified like a concrete resolution condition for this. So then I will try to like operationalize this one, and I will go like uh, I'm gonna estimate I, I'm gonna try to estimate chances that by January. 2020, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, will still recommend using SHA3, which is a concrete hashing algorithm, which is like widely used today for cryptography reasons. And this is like far better. Now we have like a concrete date where it's like uh, when the outcome is resolved, and we have like a precise condition that will tell us whether that outcome has come true or not. Okay, does that make sense? So, okay, first exercise. I'm gonna ask you to pick a thing that you want to forecast that you're interested about, that you're interested in, and I'm gonna ask you to operationalize it. If you are like short on ideas, like things that you can that you may want to uh, operationalize is, am I a good student? Or uh, chances of uh, World War Three? Or you may want to operationalize uh, chances that. Andrew Yang will be elected. Well, that's like very, that's like already operationalized. Um, these are two prompts. Uh, but you're happy to, you, you're welcome and encouraged to actually pick a prompt that is like intrinsically interesting for you. And as a note, uh, we're focusing now on like the statements that are like binary, that have like a very clearly true condition and a false condition. More advanced forecasting techniques uh, actually work with like uh, random variables that are like continuous or like discrete over a greater number of outcomes. But for now, uh, we're just going to be focusing on binary variables, all right? Okay, so you have like three minutes to pick one and operationalize it. Raise your hand if you need more time. Okay, I'm gonna get 
give more time, we have 30 seconds. that was not time uh, I'm actually like really curious about uh, what you have come up so I'm gonna pick like two people so they can share their thing if your thing is like private or you don't want to share it just like uh, make a sign okay so do you want to share what you are appreciate yes. um, I will assign 20% chance that Donald Trump will be re-elected as president in 2020 okay This is like very salient and it's like very precise. We have like a resolution date and we have like a very clear condition. Like uh, we're gonna be, uh, do not worry if you haven't assigned chances yet, we're actually gonna be working through assigning the chances uh, later. For now, let's focus on having like the outcome and the, um, and the resolution date, okay? Um, do you wanna share what you've been working on? Uh, I think the chances are by uh, New York 2021, I will accept it in Cambridge University. Awesome. Uh, by when? Um, May 2021. May 2021. Awesome. Hopefully it will be high. <laughs> cool. Um, cool. Uh, so yeah. Uh, first step and probably the hardest is like coming up with like concrete questions that have like a definite answer and that actually give you information about the things you care about. So like pat yourselves in the head because you have overcome like the first big obstacle to becoming an excellent super forecaster. Um, now we're gonna go to actually assigning chances to these uh, to this uh, to these. Uh, questions. And like here comes like uh, a very interesting thing. Uh, when Ted Locke was studying like how people who perform best at forecasting actually did the forecasts, he saw like something, uh, something particular. Like people who are not really good, they just like came up with like chances out of nowhere. And they seem to be like poorly, uh, poorly correlated to what actually happened later. But uh, super forecasters chose like a like. Sorry, I'm not explaining that right. Like people who were people who who didn't perform as well. What they did was like they used what it's called the inside view from the beginning. So they reasoned about the particular things that uh, uh, are uh, related to what the uh, the particular case at hand. So like maybe for the. Uh, and for the one that I made here, the one about cryptography and the Sathri algorithm, maybe I will go like, oh, I know that the Sathri algorithm was like developed in an open source contest, and so since the, it was not like professionally developed, then I will assign like a lower chance, and that that means like uh, I don't know, like one percent probability of this coming out as true. Um, Super forecasters did like a different thing. And not only did they do that thing, but when they, when uh, Tedlock instructed like all the forecasters to do the same, their accuracy improved. So this is not ma a mad correlation, but there seems to be some causation in it as well. Uh, what the super forecasters did is like they didn't consider the, the question that they were treating as like a one off. They were aware that 
there is nothing new under the sun, and there are like many things that have like a similar structure. And they would look for what's called a reference class. Like a similar class of events that uh, will allow that uh, carry information about the thing that you actually care about. Like no matter how unique your uh, question is, if you exercise enough creativity, you will be able to come up with like some relevant reference classes. So like, for example, if I'm trying to evaluate this claim, one thing that I could do is I could look at like previous iterations of the SA algorithm. So I could look at, well, what the hell happened with SA1? What was like the length of time that it took between it was developed, it was 1995, to when it was like deprecated. That was like 2010. Not mistaken. And uh, then, like, they uh, use like very basic, very simple statistical techniques to like estimate uh, base rates. An initial estimate uh, you, uh, that came primarily from looking at the problem from the outside view as a, a non-special member of a class of similar events. So uh, for, this, uh, for this part, it's very useful to like come up with like very silly, very simple statistical models. And there's like a powerful reason why we want like simple statistical models instead of complicated ones, which is that with complicated ones, you can actually tweak the numbers so that they tell whatever you want them to say. While with like simple models, where well, they have like fewer parameters to, uh, to tweak. So it's more likely that you're gonna be capturing more of the relevant information that is within the reference class that you're studying. So for example, for this one, we could like, uh, we could like, uh, uh, actually let's go with uh, like a different one and then like we go back to that one. So imagine that we are interested in forecasting a timelines and we want to Estimate what's the probability what's the probability that in the next year we'll have a breakthrough that will give us like basically uh, human level artificial intelligence. And then like you can look at uh, you can uh, model uh, a very simple statistical process of like, well, in 1956 there was like this big conference in which artificial intelligence became a field and like officially they were off to the races and they were trying to every year like try to come up with a way of like developing powerful A systems. And we are like 2019, and we still don't have like that level of uh, generality in our artificial intelligence systems. So we can model this of like every year, uh, conversely. And if the, if the, we, we assume that if the coin was to come up heads, then we will get AI that year, and otherwise like we would not get AI that year. So we have done 2019 minus 56, that's like 50, 60, 60, 59, right? So it's like approximately 60 uh, years where the coin has been flipped and every time that it has been flipped, it has come up like uh, fails. We haven't gotten like powerful general A systems of the kind that were envisioned by the people who uh, were working in the conference of that lab, right? So then we can go like, oh, we can use like Bayesian statistics, right? Do I scare anyone if I use the word Bayesian statistics? A bit, okay, that's, but that's fine because uh, Bayesian statistics is actually like really easy. You just start with like, we're trying to estimate what the hell is the probability per year of us getting AI? And at the beginning, we are like maximally uncertain. So we're gonna have a uniform distribution over the possible values of P uh, between like zero and one. It's a probability, it has to be between zero and one, right? And then like, uh, we have flipped that coin a number of times, and it has come up like uh, tails like 60 times. And that changes 
uh, how we distribute this probability. So like the first time that it comes up heads, that it, it comes up tails, then like we go like, oh, actually it's more likely that, let's put it like this. It's more, no, actually, yeah. It's more likely that it's more biased towards zero than more biased towards one. And then like, as you get more and more information, like you become more certain that those uh, possible biases of the coin are like more likely. And in the end, uh, we are fine with just taking like a point estimate, right? So we just want to estimate like what's the average value of P, right? And the average value of P, given uh, those 60 years of nothing, and given our uniform prior, well, that can be estimated with what's called Laplace's rule of succession, which tells you that if you start with a uniform prior and you flip a coin n times, and you get r successes, then the average value of p that this should be estimated is f plus 1 uh, divided by n plus 2. It's a fairly easy formula. And this is something that you can use yourself. You can try to model your process as coin flipping for each of the members in your reference class. In this case, like my reference class is like each of the years where like people have been working artificial intelligence and now I'm trying to estimate like what will happen the next year what will happen in 2020 or yeah cool so I can do that just by plugging in the numbers into this formula and I will come up with like a best rate base rate of probability on Isn't that cool? Like, math is useful for something. Isn't that like something beautiful? Just kidding. Um, so we're gonna, what we're going to be doing now is I'm going to ask you to go through, oh. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to go through the same exercise. I'm going uh, to ask you to uh, find a reference class for the question that you have noted before. And then like uh, try to come up with like a very simple statistical model. It's okay if you don't have like enough time to make the calculations, just like figure out how you will do it. Just think about how you will do it if you had more time and if you had like access to Wikipedia. And that will be your base rate. Does it make sense? So Pick the question that you that you chose before, find a reference class, and start a question. Uh, no, but yes, yes, it's a question. Okay. Uh, how how would I know which uh, statistical model should I apply to my particular question? Oh, uh, that's the part where like creativity comes in. Uh, <laughs> can you would, do, would you be willing to share with us what's your particular question? I have a few. Yes. For instance, um, whether or not in 2021 will be another economical crisis happening in the UA. Okay, so that's like a very good one. Uh, what we could look at is how uh, try to look back towards like the farther back ahead that you think that uh, the US uses the US uh, economy. For the world economy, I don't mind. Ex of, of, um, Western society. Okay, West Western society economy. It's okay, I'll give that too. Yeah. <laughs> let's clear, uh, let's look at um, what is like the farthest back that you think current economy is like comparable to like past economy, right? Does that question make sense? Okay. So what? Uh, what do you think is like the minimum year that will still be like comparable to current economy? To be honest, I don't know because 
I know nothing about the economy. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That's fair enough. And like normally, you need to like think a bit more about this. Uh, when I'm trying to like do forecasting quite quickly, I just go with like rule of thumbs and intuitions. Like for example, for this case, I could go to like, oh, uh, I think that probably modern economy is like comparable to what we have, what we had after World War Two, World, World War Two, for example. And maybe there was like a bit of depression there, but things got like kind of like more normal around like 1950. So my reference class is going to be the years that go from 1950 to like 2020. Uh, so my reference class is composed of like 70 years. And in each of those years, there is there's like a possible outcome. Either there was like an economic crisis or there was not. And then I would count like how many economic crises have we had? And like, oh, I'm like really bad with history, but off the top of my head, we had like the we had like the uh, fuel crisis in like the 70s. There were two fuel crises. There were two. Okay, we have like somebody who's more informed, so we'll take his word. Two full crises, and then like we also had the housing uh, economic crisis in 2008. And there is not a fat caliber that I know of in that period, but this is the point where I will go to Wikipedia and Google like economic crisis in the last century. But let's assume that that was the case, right? So we had like three possible examples. If that was the case, then like oh, we can like uh, we can like. Plug that in into our magical Laplace's rule of succession formula. And we can estimate the probability that in the next year we will have an eco uh, the base rate of e an economic crisis of like 3 plus 1 over 70 plus 2. This is like a, that, that one is like a fairly general trick. So, almost always there is a way of like finding a reference class that you can plug into that formula. Uh, there are some times where you have to be a bit more like crafty. But those cases are like a bit rare. Okay? And meanwhile, I hope that everybody who's working on their own, on their own reference class forecasting, I'm gonna give you like two more minutes to define your reference class and then like we can share and comment your findings. Raise your hand if you need more time. Okay, we're done. Okay. Um, 
I'm wondering, you over there would like to start the same? Yes. Uh, I think I want to um, uh, believe mm -hmm. this um, uh, box will uh, win the next And what reference class did uh, you choose? Uh, I thought about um, seeing the results of the past uh, five elections. Okay. In Europe? No, like in Spain. In Spain. Okay. Alex, what, what could be like the numbers that you will look at? How would you plug, uh, plug them into an equation that would give like you a probability? Uh, you, got, you have got them so far. Percent, percent of, of, um, uh, I don't know how to, uh, ultra like radical right vote. Um, and I could do a model based on Laplace like rule, but instead of uh, flipping the coin, like flipping a continuum. Okay, cool. So it would be like one with like a normal, a lot normal distribution. Yeah, cool. That would be like that would be like really awesome. Cool. Um, do you want to share what you've been working on? Okay. So I was thinking about uh, the chances that by January third, two thousand twenty, an involvement will be thrown. Okay. So I considered like all the times like an involvement has been formed. So. And I did the same as you did with the coin. And then I plus the percentage. Cool. How far did you went back? Uh, your 1979. 1979. Uh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So I, I see that you are like really good at this. I'm like <laughs> impressed. Cool. Um, So now we have uh, saw how to make like a uh, base rate, but uh, we humans have like very powerful brains that are capable of like integrating like vast amount of information, and just like looking at the reference class doesn't capture all the information that we have available to us. So let's not like dig a bit more about how super forecasters uh, do their predictions, and he found out that even though state uh, they start like with this outside view model, uh, trying to estimate like a base rate, they, uh, they don't just like remain there. On topics on which like uh, they feel like they have like extra information to like prefer this, uh, the particular member of the reference class they're interested in versus all the others, they compute in that information in the base rate using basin updating. Normally they don't do it like formally. That's that's also something worth pointing out. Like super forecasters are not machines who go through like the formal motions of like defining reference classes and then adjusting. It's more of like a, an intuitive process that they have internalized. But I think that going through the explicit process is actually like a really good uh, way of like building form. Okay, does it make sense? So what exactly is the base rate? Base the base rate. Okay, so. Everybody familiar with like uh, base theorem? We have the probability of a hypothesis given the evidence is the probability, the prior probability of the hypothesis times the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis slash probability of the evidence overall. The prior is the base rate you're starting from. And now we're gonna be trying to estimate like how to correct this prior with like the inside information that we have access to to come up with like a posterior that hopefully represents better 
our actual beliefs about the about the um, the thing that we're interested in forecasting. Does that make sense? Cool. So for this part, I'd actually like to do a change. I'm like really sorry because I think I'm super weird because of that. But actually, there are like two ways of like representing probabilities. You can represent them as fractions, but you can represent them as odds. And for this part, I like this in odd forms because uh, I think it makes like the updating a bit more clear, the interpretation of how I update. So let's go back to like the economic crisis example. Uh, if I was trying to use like, uh, if I was trying to use the odds form of Laplace's rule of succession, then that will look as n plus one over n plus one. So like, essentially this is interpreted as if uh, for every n plus one times that I expect the true outcome to come uh, to result, I expect uh, n, wait, that's not n plus one, it's n minus r and my plus one times the other outcome to, to come. Or like, easier to memorize, this is like the number of successes plus one plus the number of failures plus one. That's like the odds form. And like, if I wanted to change this back to like probability, then I will just go like S plus one over F plus one plus S plus one, and I will have that F plus S is what we were calling N before, and like S is what we were calling R before. That was a slightly confusing. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, okay. I, think, I think we're good. <coughs> so for the economic crisis one, for, uh, com for computing that in odds form, I will go like, oh, what are the number of years where uh, there has not been, th there has been, um, economic crisis, and we said there was like three, and then I will add one. It's important to add one, because even if you haven't seen any economic crisis so far, your models will allow economic crisis to still happen. Otherwise, your model is like really, really wrong. And the number of years where we haven't seen an economic crisis was like 70 minus three, so it was like 67 plus one. So, or over 68, and like, uh, how do you simplify this? It's like two over 34, but that's like one over 70. One to, six, one to 70. So like for every economic crisis, I expect 70 years without an economic crisis. Okay. And now, uh, I try to factor in my evidence, and it's like, I'm gonna try to compare like what makes like 2020 a special year compared to like the other years that we have seen so far. And maybe we go like, look, uh, maybe gonna maybe there's like some economic tension between China and the US. Well, I will go. Well, that that makes it more likely that we'll have like an economic crisis. But then on the other hand, like. We have like uh, low signs of an all scale war. So if there is there are no expectatives of war, then of like uh, a war between like the big potencies. I know that we have like India and Korea and like some stuff, but uh, overall it seems like the war does not seem to be headed to a world war. And like, this is more like a gut feeling. This is like me trying to quantify my gut feelings. I like trying to put, uh, trying to put a strong case both for like, oh, there will be an economic crisis, but also, oh, there will not be an economic crisis. Like, try to inhabit both worlds, a world in which is true and a world in which is false, and try to come up with like reasons why I expect myself to be in one world and the other. And then like, I'm gonna try to put some numbers over it. And like, here's where it gets like really tricky. Uh, I think it depends, depending on like your domain expertise, you probably want to put like more extreme numbers here. 
But uh, uh, so like, for example, for this one about economic crisis, I don't really know shit about economic crisis. So I will be like very reticent on, uh, on updating a lot over the base rate. But if I was working on the case with like the Cambridge University, then, oh, I have like more information about how do I compare to like the, tip the typical applicant of Cambridge University, right? So I will be able to like make bigger updates. So like maybe for this, I will go like, I don't know, that seems like a bad sign, but also I'm not sure. So like maybe this is like, this makes it 60 to 50, more like, like for every 60 times that I expect uh, this, uh, that I expect this to be relevant, there are like 50 times. Uh, sorry, I'm not explaining that right. Uh, essentially, I'm like trying to uh, I'm like trying to quantify how much more do I think this keeps the balance for like an economic crisis. And like for this one, I go like, oh, I think that this one is like quite relevant. And like maybe I will go like 70. 30 here. Okay, does it make sense? Kind of? Kind of. Okay, like, look, uh, the idea here is I'm trying to compute, like, uh, I'm trying to compare, I'm trying to compare, like, the relative likelihoods. Like, this represents how much more do I expect uh, to observe that China and US are in a trade war, in a world where there's an economic crisis, versus a world in which there's not. And I put myself in the, in the in, I inhabit the world of like, oh, there's actually going to be an economic crisis in 2020. Uh, ha, in, in those worlds, like, when do I expect this to, uh, to be true, and when do I expect it to be false? And it's like, oh, most of, in many of those cases, I expect it to be true, but also I will imagine that there are like cases in which like the economic crisis does not come to like a uh, trade war between China and US, but it comes from like, uh, I don't know, an international event that uh, compromises the, uh, the oil reserves and that drives up prices and then like everything goes up and the economy slows down. Okay. I like the same for that one. And in the end, like the very convenient thing about the odds form is I can just like multiply them. I go like one times 60 times 30 over 17 times 50 times 70. And like I can simplify here and there because in the end this is like a fraction. And this will give me Six times three is eighteen, and it's like seventeen times thirty-five, and I, I don't know how much that is. Those are like big numbers, big primes, right? Almost no, it's not primes. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. In international indexing, we can. In international indexing, we can. And the problem is I don't have like very good intuitions about the odds form, even if though they are like so convenient for like multiplication. So then what I could go and do is like convert this back to like probabilities. So I will go like oh, 18 over 18 times five. And can somebody give me that estimate? Okay, so like three percent. So 3% probability of a crisis next year. Uh, at this point, I check with myself. Like, do I actually believe that? And here comes a part that it's more like art than science. But like for me, that feels like 
very high. So I will try to like question like the assumptions that I've made along the way, and maybe try uh, try to argue more like for and against, and try to like go through the process and might and maybe like adjust that a bit less. And like again, like super forecasters don't actually go through like the formal process of like listing the reasons for and against, quantifying the uh, the base factors that they assign to do to those and then like go, go, go doing the literal multiplication. It's a lot more like oh, I expect the reference class, I expect the base rate to be around like uh, one, uh, 1 to 18 and then like that feels like really high or that feels like really low so I'm gonna pull it backwards, I'm gonna pull it upwards or downwards. That makes sense? One question. So in this last part what we were thinking is, uh, how more likely is that there is a crisis in a world where China and the U.S. are in a trade war versus a world in which they are not, or how is it? No, we're trying to, essentially, this is going to be the odds factor, the base factor, is going to be equal to probability of the evidence, given that the hypothesis is true, in probability of the evidence given the hypothesis is false. Yeah, actually, that's like, I still have explained this way all along. So we're trying to, we're trying to estimate what, how much more likely are we see, to see the evidence when the hypothesis is true versus like when the hypothesis is false. To be clear, the hypothesis here is there's an, econo an economic crisis in 2020? Yes. And are evidence of China and the US? Yes. Okay. And like, <coughs> yeah. Probably the word of warning is it's quite tempting to update a lot. But probably if we are not like domain experts or we're trying to forecast things that are like very complex or like are like very far into the future, you should tie your hands a bit more and be more willing to like not deviate a lot from the base rate. But still like check with yourself whether you actually believe the thing that you have ended up. If you don't believe the number that you have gotten, then there is like a chance that your intuition is like trying to tell you something, even after going through like all the modeling process. Um, your intuition seems like quite well, quite like adept at like managing a very uncertain world. So use it. Okay, uh, I think we are running out of time. So I'm just gonna, give you time to like adjust your probabilities um, in like one minute and then like we're gonna skip the last part. everybody living so I'm just gonna quickly wrap up uh, thank you everybody I hope that you enjoyed this session and that you learn a bit about how forecasting is made in practice uh, again I think that forecasting is a really cool tool to like uh, be like really clear when you speak and like improve your judgment so I hope that you get you have gotten encouraged into finding more, like finding out more about this rich world of forecasting that we are just very recently discovering. And if you are like interested in improving your inner calibration and you want to believe more whether your three percent actually happen three out of a hundred times, I recommend this very cool app that's called like Think Again. was developed by Ogs and the Future Humanity Institute. That's where I was working this summer. And uh, essentially, it's like an app where they ask you like math questions, and you have to quickly give a chance of like the question, the answer to the question being like one or other, and then it gives you more time to find your answer. And I think it's like very cool to like learn how three percent actually feels like, how ten percent actually feels like. Thank you.